Hello and welcome to my record room in sunny California. Well, it's that time again and classical music lovers, vinyl collectors everywhere are very excited because the latest batch of Deutsche Grammophon's original source series just dropped. Four amazing records, one of which you can see up there, and I'm going to talk about them right now. Now, this is actually the first time I've talked about these original source series on my channel because usually I'm reviewing them for Tracking Angle. But this time my colleague Michael Johnson has those duties, so I'm free to sort of meander on and talk about them in this more informal way. And uh, this is a blast. I just think these releases get better and better as we go along. Now, for any of you who do not yet know anything about this series, what is so special about it is how they've been done. Rainer Mayard and Sidney Meyer, who actually cuts the vinyl, Rainer does the mixing and all the preparation, they're at Emil Berliner Studios, which grew out of Deutsche Grammophon in the uh, early noughts. They're an independent engineering house, but with very close ties to Deutsche Grammophon, where Rainer Mayard started working uh, in his 20s. Anyway, Mayard has always been a huge supporter and proponent of vinyl as the ultimate way to listen to classical music or any kind of music. And he really pioneered bringing back direct-to-disc recordings, and he did a whole bunch of these um, with different orchestras, in particular working with the Berlin Philharmonic on their spectacular issue of Bernard Haitink conducting the Berlin Philharmonic for the last time before he retired in Bruckner's Seventh Symphony. Anyway, Maillard knew there were all these treasures lurking in the Deutsche Grammophon catalog, in particular from the 70s onwards, when Deutsche Grammophon, like many other companies, became interested in the possibility of quadraphonic sound in people's homes. The idea that you would have two rear channels as well as the front stereo speakers uh, to give you the whole ambience. And they started recording all their sessions with surround mics in the hall. Starting out with two channel basically for the stereo and then two channel with the surround mics. So we had four channel masters. And then later on, as they moved into multi-track, they were recording eight channels, two of those being surround mics. So what Mayad managed to do was he persuaded the higher-ups at Deutsche Grammophon to let him go into these 70s recordings and reissue them all analog directly from the original four-track master tapes. This was extraordinary. He built a special mixing desk so he could mix everything in real time. And then Sidney Meyer did her dedicated cutting. Now, what we discovered when these original source records started coming out about a year ago was that these Deutsche Grammophon records sounded so much better than we ever thought they did. They were kind of closer to the classic Decca and EMI analog sound, far more vivid. And it wasn't just because of the inclusion of the surround sound information in the stereo vinyl. What we found out was that back in the day, Deutsche Grammophon was having its records pressed all over the world because they were very popular and distributed all over the world. And in order to head off any problems, they deliberately told the pressing plants to cut these records with a far less sonic information in them in terms of dynamics, volume, etc. So this is why those old pressings just didn't sound that great in comparison to Deckers and EMIs. But all that information was actually on the master tapes. And this has been the great revelation of the original source series. Not only have we got the surround channels folded into the stereo mix, we've got so much more musical information in the grooves. And these records sound spectacular. Now, one of the interesting things is that different engineers at Deutsche Grammophon adopted different techniques in their recording. And one of the things you can notice in some of these records is you can actually hear how the engineers have manipulated their recordings 
as they're making them in terms of how they're, they've got many mics coming into the board when they do the recording session, but they mix it all down in real time to the two tracks and the extra two tracks for the acoustical room information. What you can hear on some of these recordings is you can hear how the engineers slightly manipulated the sound in real time, uh, sometimes to good effect, sometimes to less good effect. So there's been a range of quality in these vinyl reissues. Having said that, they all sound pretty spectacular. And this latest issue of Four Records is absolutely no exception. If you're interested in getting more detailed information about how these reissues were made and the whole history of Deutsche Grammophon's recording process, pressing process, etc., I recommend you go and watch my very first review of the first batch of original source recordings that came out about a year ago. It's on trackingangle.com. I'll put a link to it in the description section below this video. Oh, and by the way, do please like and subscribe. Really happy to build up the number of subscribers on this channel. Anyway, having said that, let's get into talking about these four new releases, all of which I think are quite exceptional. And frankly, I think you should get all of them. I thought I would begin with the two American orchestras. And let's begin, first of all, with the Boston Symphony Orchestra, conducted by the great Raphael Kublik, doing one of his signature works for Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Now, those of you who are classical collectors, I know, will already have your much treasured recording by Fritz Reiner on Living Stereo. This has been reissued both by Classic Records, that's this version, and also by Analog Productions. And the Analog Productions version is currently in print, so it's easily pick upable. I also have the um, Bernie Grumman 45 RPM cut he did for Classic Records, which sounds really sensational. This recording, it's just a classic, and uh, you should have it, as you should have all the living stereos that are currently in print over at Analog Productions, Acoustic Sounds. You can also get them at Elusive Disc. So I'm sure many of you were thinking, do I really need another version of the Concerto for Orchestra? I mean, that Living Stereo version is such a classic. It sounds amazing. It's an incredible performance. I was sort of in that camp. I've, I have this Kubelik in its original issue on Deutsche Grammophon in the 70s. And actually, I've always liked it. The sound in it wasn't too bad at all. But this version is a revelation. It's absolutely thrilling. And I must say that many of these original source uh, records that have come out, which were recorded in Boston Symphony Hall, which is a wonderful hall, these have been amongst the very best in the series. Uh, those of you who read my articles in Tracking Angle will know that I completely raved about the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, recorded by Seiji Ozawa. And I, I would save it up to this point. It's my favorite of a whole series, probably along with the Gundel Janowitz Four Last Songs. Although I think the Berlioz is sonically uh, really in a class of its own. It's a thrilling performance. This is really terrific. The rejuvenation that's happened with this, courtesy of Rainer Meyer and Sidney Meyer, is absolutely amazing. For those of you who don't know this piece, it is literally a concerto for orchestra. You have, I think it's like five movements, and he just plays with all the different instruments of the orchestra, groups of instruments playing off each other. It is literally like a concerto for orchestra. It's not a symphony. It's much more concertante, as we say, this idea of the sounds of the different instruments playing off against off each other. It was actually commissioned by the Boston Symphony, so this orchestra has this work in its bones. And Kublik, great Czech conductor, I mean, this is just completely his kind of music. This performance is just thrilling and so atmospheric because you've just got this huge, huge sound stage, the sense of being in the hall, the instruments playing off each other. You've got the gorgeous wind section of the Boston Symphony at that time, which also came into play in the recording of the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. So really, even if you were on the fence about this one, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think it's well worth picking up, even if you 
already have the Chicago Symphony Orchestra with Fritz Reiner, a classic in its own right. Moving on to the next American orchestra, which is the Great Chicago Symphony Orchestra in Bruckner's Fourth Symphony. A huge romantic piece, and wow, this is a sonic blockbuster. Now, as of taping this, Michael Johnson's reviews on Tracking Angle, only one of them has gone up so far, which is of this record, the Bruckner Fourth. And I'll have links to all of those reviews in the description section below this video, and you absolutely should check them out. Michael is a wonderful writer, and I, what I, one of the things I love about him, he comes from a perspective of a working professional orchestral musician. He's an oboist, and so he has great insights into the sounds of the different orchestras. Well, he gave this a rave review. 11 for performance, 11 for sound. And if you know anything about uh, orchestras of this period, of American orchestras, you know that the brass section in the Chicago Symphony was just famous. It still is famous at this time, just one of the most thrilling brass sections ever. Now let's talk about this uh, because it's a very different sound from the European orchestras like the Vienna Philharmonic, the Berlin Philharmonic would have a more burnished brass sound uh, around a slightly mellower, I would say. The Chicago brass, it's in your face. It's terribly dy dynamic. Uh, the horns in particular, the, the lead horn player, I actually got some of his recordings uh, from this period, Dale Clevenger, he was on a really fine recording of Giolini conducting the Britain uh, Serenade for Tenor Horn and Strings with Robert Teer. Dale Clevenger played the horn solo on that. Wonderful horn player, and you're going to hear him all over this piece. Let's talk about Bruckner a little bit. So Bruckner is often paired with Mahler, the great late 19th century composer who writes these huge romantic symphonies, uh, the apotheosis of the romantic symphony. Basically, after Beethoven's nine symphonies, the composers who came afterwards during the 19th century, the romantic composers, they were always trying, in a way, to outdo Beethoven, reach for the most romantic statement with the biggest orchestra. I mean, that's a generalization, but that, that's the general idea. And Bruckner was no exception. He's interesting. Um, I'm not going to get into all the weeds about him, but he basically made his career as an organist, uh, lived a fairly sheltered life, was a devout Christian, and very much connected with the sense of religion, of faith, but also of the countryside in which he lived. And this is all in his symphonies. You can hear the sacred quality and you can also hear the love of nature. He was also a an ardent studier of counterpoint. Bach was his god as Bach was for many composers in Germany and beyond and he was extremely adept at writing complicated counterpoint that is when you have different lines of music working against each other and fugues and all of this. Um, his music, you could describe it almost as sounding like organ music. He loves to play off the different sections of the orchestra. He models a lot of his symphonies on the basic model of Beethoven's Ninth, this idea of the beginning of the Ninth Symphony where music emerges quietly, almost out of, you could call it the primordial soup, just slow trembling strings out of which a theme emerges and then we have a grand statement. Now, people have said rather rudely that Brooklyn just wrote the same symphony nine times, well, or 10 times if you count the symphony, which is called the Zero Symphony. Um, I think that's a little bit unfair, but there is definitely um, a quality in his symphonies which is shared between all of them. Now, this is somewhat different from Mahler. They're, they're lumped together a lot. Mahler is a little bit later, and Mahler, I think for most people, is a, is a far more dramatic, more varied symphonist. 
but for the true aficionado, there's something really special about Bruckner. And you can absolutely say that Bruckner for German conductors is kind of, this is a, a composer they want to get to grips with. And, you know, going back to the great um, Fert Wengler and other German conductors of, of his ilk, going up through Herbert von Karajan, and going through to people like Eugen Joachim, and I'm going to come to all of this again later. Now, what's interesting about this recording, it's of his fourth symphony, which is generally um, the most often played along with seven, eight, nine. Seven is probably the other most popular one. Um, this one he actually titled himself uh, as the Romantic, and it really does have overtones of German romanticism of the countryside, the third movement, which is a scherzo, sounds just like a hunting party. And, and actually, um, as I was listening to this recording, I kept being reminded of the wonderful hunting sequence in Haydn's uh, The Seasons, in particular in the fantastic recording by uh, Paul McCreesh, uh, which came out a few years ago. And if you haven't heard that, Oh my God, you have to listen to it. it. It just reinvents that piece. Anyway, that has a great big hunting scene in it. And the scherzo here, I mean, it, it, it's just a hunt in the woods. It's tremendous with the horns calling from the distance. What's unusual about this recording is that it's made by a very young musician, Daniel Barenboim. This is one of his very first, if not his first records as a conductor. He was better known as a Wunderkind pianist, uh, he was married to Jacqueline Dupre, the brilliant cellist who most tragically got multiple sclerosis and both her career and then her life were cut short. And he made all kinds of wonderful records with her and his friends. And by this time, he had already recorded the complete Beethoven piano sonatas for EMI, the piano concertos with Klemperer. He was a major figure, but he was always interested in conducting. And it's very interesting that he tackles this most German of symphonies. Now, the thing about Bruckner is it's a real challenge, both of the conductor, the orchestra, and <laughs> frankly, the audience. Uh, these symphonies are long. It's very easy for the conductor to focus on the moment over the overall architectural span you have these thrilling interplays between strings, wind, brass. I mean, when the brass come in, they're so powerful. But it's really difficult to shape this into an overall musical argument. It can start to sound very episodic. Now, I'm not saying that this recording falls into that trap, but it does, on some level, leave something wanting. Now, let me say right up front, you need to buy this record. It is such a thrill in terms of the recording. The orchestra is just unreal. I, I have rarely heard um, an orchestra sound this massive on a, just a regular record. It's extraordinary. The original source uh, remixing that Reiner and Sydney has done and recutting, I mean, it's just incredible. And the Chicago Brass, wow. When they come in at full pelt, it's something else. It is utterly thrilling. But I have to say that by the time I got to the end of it, I felt I was lacking something. And um, it's not that it's an unmusical or a fine performance, because it really is. And Barenboim really has the measure of the symphony. And I think actually this is a great record for anyone who's not explored Bruckner. This is a great place to start because it, it very much, it, it's vivid, it's in the moment, it, it doesn't slow down too much because there are some Bruckner recordings which are really slow. No, he keeps it moving and it is really beautiful and it's not unmusical. But I did find myself by the end of it thinking, I'm going to go back to some of my other recordings and to see if I'm imagining that I'm missing something. So my first stop was one of the great Bruckner recordings of the early days of stereo. And this is by Otto Klemperer on EMI. 
And this is a reissue on Testament. These are very fine reissues. Now, the truth of the matter is to find an original pressing of this, it's going to cost you a fortune. Uh, <laughs> so unless you're a very dedicated collector, uh, you don't want to do that. This is actually on what's called the second label for these Columbia EMIs. Um, I think originally this might have had the magic note emblem on the middle, but these Testament reissues are really fine. And um, there's also a reissue on Q, which I believe Michael mentions in his article. Look, this is a classic performance. Yes, as Michael says, it's not as perfectly drilled as the Barenboim or even many other recordings, uh, but this is really special and Klemper is in his element in this music, so don't ignore this one. Being a Bruckner conductor is something of a specialty for certain conductors, and I'm going to just mention a few here. Now, those of us who are into classical vinyl and especially into this original source series, right now we've got this conductor on our mind, Herbert von Karajan, uh, because they're going to reissue as an original source box set all his Bruckner symphonies in a few months. And what's really special about this is that these recordings were made on 8-track, and this is going to be the debut of Rainer Maillard being able to mix directly from the 8-track, including the two tracks of surround ambient sound. This is a revolution. No one has ever done this. He built a special mixer for it, and everyone is really excited about this. Now, Carian was conducting Bruckner from very early in his career, and this is his recording from this cycle of the Romantic Symphony, Symphony Number no. 4. Now, I didn't re-listen really to this for this review because I wanted to wait until uh, the rejuvenated, as it were, version comes out in a couple of months. Um, it's a really good recording, but actually what I did do instead was go back to another Carian recording, which people are less, maybe less familiar with, and this is one he did on EMI uh, in the 70s, I think it was. And it was a three LP box set partnered with the Seventh Symphony and uh, recorded in the Jesus Christus Kirche in Berlin, but a different recording team than normally did the, the Deutsche Grammophon because it's for EMI. Now, I'm a big fan of Karian's EMI catalog, especially uh, the earlier ones with the Philharmonia, but leading into some of these Berlin Phil sessions. And I put this on immediately after listening to the Barenboim. And despite the fact that this is certainly not in the same sonic category, I immediately heard what I'd been missing in the Barenboim, the sense of a conception behind the music, the sense that we are moving towards something. It's just a far more mature, experienced interpretation. And actually, this sounds really, really good. This is a lovely set, and I would highly recommend it to anyone interested in pursuing Carian's interpretations further. They've actually reissued all of Carian's EMI catalog on CD, beautifully remastered, actually. And you can get that, and it's all available in different separate boxes. So I, I don't remember which box this is included in. I, I have the whole set over there somewhere. Um, so you don't have to get absolutely everything in order to get this recording. Or you can try and pick up the LPs, a regular UK pressing. This sounds really good. The other great Bruckner conductor, who also recorded for Deutsche Grammophon at the same time as Carian was recording, is this guy, oh. Eugen Joachim. And this is his first set of the symphonies on Deutsche Grammophon. This is a beautiful edition. Um, what's distinctive about this is it's on the heavy uh, platters, early pressings with the large tulips. And these early uh, large tulip pressings are the best way to buy the earlier Deutsche Grammophon uh, recordings because they're mastered with tubes in the mastering chain. Beautiful booklet. This is just a lovely, lovely set. And, you know, you, if you're into Bruckner, 
you have to have Joachim. And you are spoiled for choice. You can either go with this set, and you can obviously get all the records separately, or he recorded it late again, uh, later in his career. Oh, another set on EMI with the great Dresden Staatskapelle. Now, I heard the Dresden Staatskapelle a couple of times live in Bruckner, both with Bernard Haitin conducting at the proms. Once was doing the Seventh Symphony, one was doing the Ninth Symphony. And for me, they are not only my, probably my favorite orchestra because of their sound and a range of other things, but also probably my favorite Bruckner orchestra. They just have exactly the right burnished tone. Uh, the way the brass and wind sound with the strings, it's such a great Bruckner sound. You have to remember that they were in East Germany, and so they their sound did not develop in the same way that the Western orchestras did, many of which just started all to sound the same, and frankly, today do generally sound the same. This is a, a wonderful set, and uh, you can buy these separately, these symphonies separately. They can be a little bit hard to find. You're probably going to have to look for them on German EMI. Uh, this set, it was pressed in Germany, I believe, yeah. Um, there you go, that's how the labels look. Uh, it sounds incredible. It's very different from the earlier set. I wouldn't want to be without either. But sticking with the Symphony Number no. 4 specifically, I wanted to go to two recordings which I had in my mind, which I think are very, very special. One of which I'm sure collectors will have heard of, another you may not know so much about. So a few years ago, the Berlin Philharmonic on its own label, which is an incredible label, just full of treasures, they issued this box. It's on CD, but don't ignore it just because it's on CD. This is a cycle of a complete Bruckner symphonies, but with different conductors conducting the orchestra. And Bernard Heitink, who is simply one of the great Bruckner conductors, and I, I haven't mentioned his early cycle for Philips on vinyl, which is again one of the great cycles. I have not all of the symphonies, but nearly all of them as individual releases. Funnily enough, I don't have number four, the Romantic. But for example, that early version with, it's with the Amsterdam Concert Cabal of the 7th is, is absolutely glorious, uh, practically of an audiophile quality, that recording, worth seeking out. But I don't have his number four. But in this set, he is conducting two of the symphonies, I believe. Uh, yes, number four and number five. And I went straight to listen to this number four again, because I remember it being really fine. And for my money, in some ways, maybe because I've heard him live, uh, I think is the guy in Bruckner. He just has a way into it, which I think is really the best. If I'm going to pick the best, I think it probably is. Carrie Anne is very special to me, and I cannot wait to revisit the cycle in its rejuvenated version. It was always compromised by the Sonics, but Karian was my introduction to Bruckner, so he always has a special place in my heart. But Heitink, there's just something about him in this music. He really, really gets it. And I put on this fourth, and yeah, it just, it tells a story and it takes you right inside the music in a way that Barenboim simply doesn't. Barenboim is wonderful on so many levels but he just doesn't have that depth. I mean, he was very young. He hadn't been conducting a lot of Bruckner when he did that complete cycle of, of all the symphonies for Deutsche Grammophon. He's gone on to record it twice since. I, I have to confess, I, Baron Boehm as a conductor, uh, it, it's rare for me to get really excited about one of his recordings, I have to say, but that, that's just me. But Heitink, in this symphony is wonderful. It's a very different sound. You know, it's recorded live in the Berlin Philharmonic. It's a much more modern kind of acoustic, but the sound is far more blended. 
uh, you feel like the brass are really part of the orchestra. He doesn't let them go completely, you know, full tilt on their own so that they dominate everything, which is always a danger in Bruckner performances and especially live and in certain recordings. For example, some of the Sinopoli recordings on Deutsche Grammophon I, I'm almost unlistenable because they just sort of, it's just being pummeled by the brass. Uh, Barenboim is not like that. But this recording, it's, it's very special. And if you don't have this set and are interested in exploring Bruckner, this is a great way to do it because it's all these different conductors. It's beautifully put together. I mean, these sets are just exquisite. There you have all the CDs, and then there are also the performances are on Blu-ray. You have these incredible, this incredible book full of information, great essays, photos. Um, these Berlin Philharmonic label issues are extraordinary. So I, I put this on. I hadn't intended to listen to the whole thing, just to sample it a bit. I ended up listening to the whole thing because it's, I think it, it was, it's just wonderful. Look, it's not audiophile spectacular in the way that the Barenboim is on vinyl. It still sounds really, really good. But if you're going to go for the ultimate Bruckner Fourth in terms of interpretation, in terms of sonics, I think there's only really one to go for, and it's a complete classic. Now, I couldn't find my vinyl copy of this. It's around somewhere. It's Karl Böhm with the Vienna Philharmonic on Decca. And actually, you can find it also in this wonderful set, which, like the Berlin Philharmonic set, it's one orchestra of the Vienna Philharmonic, um, and it's all different conductors conducting the different symphonies recorded over about a 10-year period with the Vienna Philharmonic, which I would argue, along with the Dresden, Staatskapelle, and the Berlin, is really the great Bruckner orchestra. And I, I would probably pair it with the Dresden Staatskapelle because, again, the instruments have their own particular distinctive sound. The wind and brass are constructed slightly differently. And there's that incredible, sweet Viennese string sound. And it, it's just perfect for Bruckner. Now, this recording by Karl Böhm, he did two great Bruckner recordings at this time in the 70s, recorded in the Sofian Saal by Decker. The recording producer was John Carlshaw. It was the classic Decker team who had worked on the ring, had recorded extensively with the Vienna Philharmonic in the Sofian Saal in Vienna, unlike the Deutsche Grammophon recordings, which have largely done in the Music for Rhein, which is their main concert hall. Decker always recorded in the Sophie and Saal. It's a very distinctive sound. It's a sound I love. I collect all those Decker Vienna Philharmonic recordings from the 60s and 70s. It's just a, a distinctive, wonderful, rich Decker sound. And the Symphony No. 4, it's like Heiting. Berm just has this music in his bones. He unerringly knows how to lead us through it. And it's riveting. You can pick up the 2LP original UK pressing, or I'm sure there is a US, UK made uh, pressing you can find. But this set is actually really, really good. Very nicely remastered. And it's got a range of great uh, recordings on here. Well worth checking out. So in conclusion, I don't want to make it sound like I'm unenthusiastic about this record. It really is phenomenal, and I'm pretty thrilled to have it. And God, does it give your system a great workout. I was on one of the online forums, and, and one person commented uh, after listening to this that he thought his hi-fi was going to explode. Uh, I know what he means. It's, it's really incredible. Michael gave it the top rating, 11.11. He was thrilled to bits about it. I just have some slight hesitations, which I have shared with you, but I still think this is a record to buy. And look, it's got, it's two, it's on two LPs, which is wonderful. They haven't tried to press it all into two, just two sides. It has uh, plenty of room in which to expand. You've got the usual original source stuff, 
extra photos, recording information, the extra booklet. Um, yeah, this is a thrill ride. Coming up in part two, I'll talk about the next two original source releases. Stay tuned for that and also for a surprise unboxing. I wonder what it could be for. <laughs>